thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Yuri Lelli. Some of you already know. Uh, I'm working for, for ARM. I've been working for ARM for the last three years. Uh, I've been following the energy aware scheduler uh, effort. I'll talk about it a bit later. But basically, I'm here to say that uh, I don't know if you actually know Skedaddle, but it's actually alive. So that's basically the main news I have here. I think, I mean, there is people sitting over there. If you can come forward, it's probably easy also for, for me. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. Can you actually sit like there are all these spaces here? I, I won't, I mean, it would be a pretty relaxed uh, presentation, but just thanks. I won't, I mean, that would be just, I won't make any question, anything, so. Hey, okay, thanks a lot. Well, actually, I'm, I'm lying, so I'll actually make questions because uh, the problem is that uh, I have to assume in this presentation that you have uh, a little background on what the deadline is because I won't uh, have time to cover the basics and I cover the new features. So I'll be making questions and uh, I also get prices. So let's see how it goes. All right, that's the, the intended agenda. Uh, I'll quickly cover, there is one slide uh, set in the, the background of SCA deadline. Uh, then basically there is a why. So why uh, all of a sudden we have this new set of features that we actually developing. And then I'll cover the, the features that are actually being on development. So there will be memory reclaiming, then uh, frequency and CPU scaling, uh, coupling and uh, with the frequency selection, so CPU thread governor, and then group scheduling. All right, let's get started. So what and why? Deadline scheduling. Uh, so this thing has been around for, yeah, something like three years. It's been merged in uh, 314 kernel. And uh, I'm, I'm saying that it's alive now because basically in the last three years, uh, I basically had a bit maintaining it. That there's been like uh, several bugs to fix and other stuff to do, but nothing major actually happen on this, uh, on this, on this, on this scheduling class. Uh, what's a SCAD deadline? SCAD deadline is basically another scheduling class. In, is an RT scheduling policy. RT like, uh, for example, SCAD RR or SCAD FIFO. And uh, the difference is that using SCAD deadline, you can actually explicitly uh, give actually the, the kernel per, per task latency constraints. So there is actually an API with which you can uh, 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 give this information to the kernel. And uh, it basically, the algorithm itself, by design, avoids salvation. And in general, it's uh, basically enriching the shadow knowledge about the quality of service constraints that the task might have. It basically implements EDF and CBS. And that's the first question. So who's going to tell me what EDF and CBS stands for? OK. OK. CBS. <laughs> Anybody else? So you, you, you actually get the price. So this, this question was actually two pens. I'll have uh, one pen handed to you. This is a very uh, nice pen. This, this is for you. I put it here, and you can collect afterwards. I mean, as you know, I mean, they're pretty cheap uh, items, but we do pretty inexpensive chips in ARM. So that's, that's why, right? So CBS. Who's going to tell me for another pen? Nobody, really? All right. So, so uh, I get my pen, and CBS stands for Constant Bandwidth Server. Uh, it's the, actually the nice, uh, I'd say this is the nice thing here, because EDF is basically pretty dummy, so you uh, basically schedule the task with the earliest deadline. Uh, it's like a priority-based uh, algorithm based on deadlines. But the nice thing is that the CBS, it's an algorithm and this algorithm actually uh, picks the, let's say, the dynamic, the dynamic deadlines of the, the different tasks. And actually, it's that algorithm that uh, it makes, uh, for example, temporal isolation and uh, starvation, avoiding starvation possible. All right. Uh, if you uh, want to actually have more details, I actually gave a presentation to last year ELC. You find the uh, link there, and through, uh, through the slides, 
also be referring to papers uh, describing the uh, algorithms. So you can actually go and offline search more about this. So, but why uh, this developing is now happening? Well, the why is that uh, in ARM, we have been working in the last four or five years on this thing that we call energy aware scheduling. It's basically a, serial, a set of extension to both the Linux kernel scheduler and several subsystems, for example, CPU Freak, to actually make them uh, uh, power and performance aware. So both like meeting the performance requirements of uh, user space application while saving energy. And uh, that effort so far has only been uh, basically modifying and taking care of modifying scale normal uh, scheduler wise. Then uh, last year, uh, this set of uh, changes got merged in the Android common kernel and is uh, basically now used by Android. And then, uh, in that particular case, uh, basically for Android performance, uh, for the workloads that we care most, it's actually uh, meaning meeting latency requirements more than actually performing more work. So when you actually have strict latency requirements, SCAD normal can be, maybe it's not like the best fit. And what's actually happening currently is that uh, SCAD 5 also RT scheduling class and policy are currently used to actually be able to meet these uh, uh, latency requirements for certain tasks. Now, basically my point here is that uh, for the same, uh, I actually believe, I like to prove this because this is really uh, experimental and work in progress uh, stuff that I'm actually uh, gonna talk about, but I really believe that uh, uh, for the same use cases, we can actually uh, make better job using deadline. It should be, it's a theoretically be better fit. And actually also, uh, let's say that Android actually already does uh, make some modification to the mainline SCAD FIFO. And I'm not sure that those modifications can ever get upstream, just because uh, I guess the feeling that I got from my maintenance is that SCAD FIFO uh, is probably not the best thing you want to modify. Instead, you probably have to do to shed deadline. So what I'm saying is that uh, if we know, and we know that we are uh, gonna make modification to SCAD deadline, those, discussing those on many list should be less contentious. That's my uh, personal feeling. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I want to mention that the, this, um, this work is not only ARM doing this, but we are basically collaborating currently with uh, Scuola Superiore Santana Pisa. Scuola Superiore Santana Pisa is basically the uh, university I've been uh, studying uh, before joining ARM, and actually the whole, the whole SCAD deadline project uh, was born there. So while I was there, actually, we got this thing merged. So it's basically the same guys that continue uh, working on, on the project. All right. Okay, so those, that was basically the general introduction. But let's, um, yeah, let's talk about what are the new features. So, bandwidth reclaiming. Uh, what's the problem with the current uh, uh, SCAD deadline implementation? So, I guess the main problem, the main uh, thing that be, might be problematic while uh, uh, trying to use SCAD deadline for uh, basically a soft real-time uh, type of application, like for example, Android rendering pipeline, is that the task bandwidth, so the amount of CPU uh, that they can actually associate to the task is fixed. So basically you have this uh, syscall called SCAD set after. You call it for your task, and then you basically associate a runtime and a period to this task. So it's basically a fraction of CPU time. And then it's actually enforced. So if the task tries to execute for more then it's actually granted to him, it will be stopped. And that, I mean, it can be problematic because, for example, what happens if uh, you occasionally need more bandwidth than what you actually asked for? I don't know, there might be uh, fluctuation in the uh, network traffic, or, for example, if you are a task uh, that belongs to a rendering pipeline, there might be some certain heavy frames you actually have to render, and just for one of those, you need more bandwidth, so, you might be uh, missing your deadlines just because the uh, bandwidth allocation is so strict. 
So the proposed solution, and it's proposed, basically there, are, there have been uh, at least four uh, sets on, on the discussion on the Linux kernel mini list that is gonna be uh, most probably a post in like next week or week after next. It's uh, something that we call bandwidth reclaiming. Uh, the idea is that uh, you would allow tasks to consume more than what they have been allocated at uh, syscall time, at the admission control time. Of course, uh, to uh, don't risk to jeopardize everything, everybody else, so because we have still scared other scared fee for task, you can uh, allow uh, this reclamation to happen up to a maximum of the CPU time. And of course, if, if this doesn't break others scared deadline guarantees, so you don't want to jeopardize uh, other scared deadline tasks. All right, so uh, the algorithm that we actually implement is called uh, GRAB. Uh, it stands for Greedy Reclamation of Unused Bandwidth. And uh, I guess, I mean, to, uh, it can be a bit tricky to understand uh, the, how, I mean, the particularity of, of this algorithm, but I guess the name is actually uh, give you a big hint. Because basically, uh, the basic idea is that uh, when uh, I have, so I, I will emit some, some task to the system, and I will have a fraction of a CPU time uh, spare, so nobody's using that time. And the idea is that uh, uh, the task that is uh, currently running will greedily uh, use the portion of bandwidth that is not currently used by the others. So that's why greedy reclamation of unused bandwidth. And that makes uh, the implementation algorithm more mm, very simple. Uh, it's uh, really a, a I mean, minor modification that actually be made to implement this thing. So it basically composed by three main components. Uh, one is uh, we had to track the utilization of the uh, active tasks, so the tasks that are currently active on the system, because we want to reclaim the portion that is not active. Uh, then we, have, uh, we can use this information to modify the accounting rule. Uh, it, it's basically how we keep track of the runtime uh, that we actually are granting to a task. And then, well, I, I quickly go through one of the issues that we found out while uh, implementing this thing and extending the support to multiprocessor uh, systems. So the original algorithm was actually designed for uniprocessors. So as soon as you uh, try to um, support multiprocessor, you'll find some issues there. And I'll detail about one of those, just to give you an idea. Uh, as said, there are um, references to the papers and you can find uh, way more details there. Okay, so. Uh, let's try to understand what tracking of the active utilization means. I guess this is basic. This and the next one are uh, kind of the most tricky uh, slides of the whole presentation. So please bear, bear with me. Let's see if we can get through this. All right, so uh, I'll make an example to try to uh, make this thing easier. So let's say that you have uh, a task that has a bit into the system. And of course, this task has uh, a runtime and a period. The runtime here is depicted by the capital uh, QI, and uh, the period is capital TI. So those are the two parameters you actually specified when calling the SCAD setup syscall. Now, this task, uh, let's say that was sleeping, then it activates for the first time uh, during, uh, during a period. The, the idea is that uh, you will be tracking the, uh, the sum of the active utilization of all the tasks per CPU. So you have, uh, we basically added uh, a pair run queue uh, variable co called uh, running bandwidth that actually keeps track of this sum. So when a task wakes up for the first time, it's pretty easy. So you know that this bandwidth, its used utilization is basically runtime divided by period, so QI divided by TI and you can just uh, increase your act by this amount uh, of bandwidth as soon as the task wakes up, so that you know that the other task cannot reclaim this task uh, bandwidth, okay? That's easy. Then, the tricky bit is that what happens, uh, so the tricky bit is uh, understanding when you can actually remove 
this task's uh, contribution uh, from UACT. Because the problem is that uh, if, for example, a task goes to sleep and you remove uh, instantaneously his uh, contribution to the reclaiming, so his contribution to the active utilization, the other task can actually reclaim instantaneously his, uh, his bandwidth. So if he then wakes up again in the same period, he could actually uh, find out that the others used his bandwidth. So he will be basically uh, potentially jeopardized. So you don't want that. Let's say that uh, there are basically two things that can happen. One is the simplest one. The simplest one is uh, the task executes for a bit. I'm not repeating this one. What I'm repeating is the uh, more tricky one. But let's say that the, the simplest one is task starts executing and then it consumes all its runtime in this period. In that case, uh, it will be throttled because we implement basically throttling. And uh, at that point in time, you, can, you actually know that you can remove his, uh, utili uh, his contribution to the active utilization just because he, he already depleted all its available runtime. But what happens if the task uh, uh, actually goes to sleep and has some le uh, leftover runtime to consume? Now, uh, the tricky bit is that uh, you have to remember uh, what the constant bandwidth server does when the task wakes up. There is one of the rules uh, implemented by the algorithm that checks uh, this inequality. So, second question. Who's gonna tell me what this, uh, what this inequality actually checks? So why do we want to check, uh, use the uh, remaining runtime divided by uh, basically the deadline minus this amount of time when a task wakes up and compare that with the theoretical uh, worst case uh, bandwidth. Any idea? Really not? So basically, uh, let's see if I can help you. Um, as said, the task goes to sleep at this, uh, this isn't time. It has some runtime uh, leftover runtime. Then you want to know if it wakes up in the, in the same period, if it's gonna use uh, its runtime, its leftover runtime, no matter what. The problem is that if it wakes up, for example, here, pretty close to the deadline, it will actually go and execute for the, I mean, using more than what allocated. Just because uh, it's basically free to execute because it's probably the highest priority task. So if there is, for example, another task that is running con concurrently with him, he will basically execute in, this, in the other task uh, reservation. So this, this thing actually just check if we can recycle or not the current runtime. Um, so basically what we do in practice is that when the task goes to sleep, we actually have to compute this point in the, in the or time in the future called the zero lag time. This is actually deriving from this inequality. So basically you make this inequality and then you calculate t uh, from this thing. And t is actually your zero, zero lag time. So basically you know that after this is in time, the task uh, cannot reuse the leftover because if he actually is gonna use the leftover, it's gonna cause troubles to other tasks. More or less? Not really? <laughs> okay. Uh, but okay, okay. Let, let's say that uh, maybe you believe me, so it's basically what's, what's happening. So you, you go to sleep, you compute this thing, and you actually set a timer to fire at this instant in time that will remove the task uh, bandwidth from the U, U act. That's in practice how the uh, implementation works. Okay, so that, that's for C. That's the tracking of uh, active utilization. This thing happens uh, on each CPU. All right, now that you have your active utilization thing, you uh, can actually use that to implement the reclaiming itself. 
the current um, accounting rule, it's pretty easy uh, because basically a task, a task that wakes up and starts executing, at each tick, you actually call this function called uh, update cool DL. At each tick and also the last time when the task goes to sleep. And this function basically uh, uses the delta xx, so it's the, basically the deltas between uh, the, the last time and now. It can be four milliseconds, one millisecond, depending on the hertz rate. And then decrement, the, decrements the runtime of that value so that uh, you know when the task will be depleting its runtime because you then want to stop the task as soon as the runtime uh, becomes zero or, or negative. To be able to actually uh, reclaim the other's bandwidth, the idea is that uh, uh, you want to reclaim basically, so U act is, uh, uh, is a value that go, that, that, that's between one and zero. So it's a fraction of the 100% uh, CPU time. The idea is that you want to reclaim one minus the U act. And if you do the math, you actually come up with uh, this, uh, this equation here. So instead of removing the, the whole delta exec, you're actually removing a fraction of, the de of that delta exec. To make an example, if the task is a 30% uh, uh, utilization task, uh, you will multiply in the delta exec by 0 0.3. So if you execute for uh, nine milliseconds, you can actually, you actually remove three milliseconds. So basically, you have more time to complete. Uh, but that, I mean, if you actually allow to th this task to actually uh, reclaim 100% of CPU time, that will be a problem for non-deadline tasks. So you will end up uh, starving other, other guys. Uh, simple example to try to understand better the, this point is, uh, so let's say that you have a uh, five second over uh, 10 second task that can actually re reclaim. So if you can reclaim 100% of the CPU, what, what does it happen? Anybody that can help me here? Because that's actually another quiz. <laughs> so this is probably easier to, to, to compute. So let's say, uh, so what's the current UX? So consider there is only this task on the run queue and has uh, a runtime of, of five seconds and a period of 10 seconds. Sorry? 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 is actually the current U act. So let's say that, that this task is uh, executing, and basically at each instant in time, uh, let's say that it executes for one millisecond, but instead of removing one millisecond of uh, runtime from each runtime, how much you remove? by using this formula here, 0.5. So basically you remove 0.5 millisecond every one millisecond. If you do this for uh, considering that the runtime is uh, five seconds, basically you will up executing for 10 seconds. And that's basically all you'll be con constantly executing over your period. That's basically, I give you a USB pen because uh, anyway, <laughs> I have it here. So that's basically what happens. Uh, you multiply by 0 0.5 and you build deplete in your runtime in 10 seconds. So that's, that's basically, if the task doesn't reclaim, it gets stopped after five seconds and the other task can actually run and they're happy. But then if you implement the reclaiming and uh, it's unbounded, the task will constantly execute for over the 10 seconds and constantly do that so the others cannot execute anymore. Does it make sense? Okay, so the, the solution here, uh, and you, well, again, you had a bit to believe me here, but that's basically uh, easy to compute, is to actually uh, have another variable called umax that you can actually uh, set to be the, uh, the limit of bandwidth you can actually reclaim. In this case, for example, in the same example, if you set the, the max to be 0 0.9, the task will only reclaim up to 90% of the available runtime. And so it basically gets to execute for maximum nine seconds, and you will have one second of uh, time for the others to execute. 
that's basically the solution for this problem. Okay. Uh, yeah, multiprocessor. Uh, let's say that uh, we actually discovered th this problem uh, just because the as said the algorithm was actually designed for a single processor. Uh, let's say that you have two CPUs and you have a task that goes to sleep at this instant in time. So you actually, when you woke up the first time, his contribution to the UX has been uh, uh, added to uh, the UX of, of CPU K. Then he goes to sleep. Uh, you set the zero leg uh, timer. But then, uh, uh, let's say that when he wakes up again, so in this point in time, he wakes up again, you have another uh, higher priority task uh, executing on, the, on CPU K in this case. So the task is actually put to, to run on another CPU. Uh, since basically nothing happens if the task wakes up before the zero leg time uh, at the UI uh, of the CPU the task was running on, what you do is basically you don't do anything to the UX, you just remove the zero leg time, but then when the task actually, for example, depletes its runtime, you'll be subtracting its uh, contribution to CPU J UX, and that's gonna be uh, a bug because it's basically, uh, it's gonna be uh, negative. So in this case, the fix was um, pretty simple. So basically what we do, uh, when a task has actually migrated, you uh, both uh, can cancel the zero leg time and also uh, instantaneously migrate the task contribution between the two CPUs so that everything, everything is fine when the task is blocked again. All right? Okay, uh, some simple um, data and results from, from, uh, from synthetics. Uh, as said, this is a work in progress. Basically, my next uh, step is I will uh, tell you um, in, in a while is to try and start using this thing, for example, on Android. But I mean, this thing is basically a simple example. Here I have uh, uh, one task that is uh, executing inside a six millisecond over 20 millisecond uh, reservation. A task is a, it actually has a constant execution time, so every time it's activated, it's executing for five milliseconds. You have uh, another task on a single CPU here uh, that actually has a reservation of 45 milliseconds over 260 milliseconds. The problem with this task is that uh, it uh, experiences occasional variation in its actual runtime. So it varies between 35 milliseconds and 52 milliseconds. So there will be uh, instant in time in which it will try to execute for more than 40, uh, 45 milliseconds. And you see here that uh, basically uh, this is task two without reclaiming. Uh, here, I'm basically depicting a cumulative distribution function of the uh, major, uh, major response time of the task at each activation. So we actually measure how, how much time the task actually required to, to finish its current activation. And uh, basically, this means that uh, there, are, there, there is basically at least 40%, 35-40% of the cases in which the uh, 25, maybe a bit less, but I, there is a non-null percentage of the activa activation of task two in which the response time is actually higher than, the, uh, than, than what task two actually wanted, the 260 milliseconds. So and that's why, that was basically the, the problem that I was telling uh, right at the start, that this mechanism is too, uh, is too strict, is too fixed. Uh, using uh, instead reclaiming. So reclaiming basically the uh, one millisecond plus uh, up to the Umax that you set up in the, in the system. You can actually, task two can actually uh, always, uh, in this case, um, finish before its uh, reservation period. So that's basically meeting always its deadlines. That's basically depicts easily how the algorithm actually helps and works. Okay, so uh, once it is in, what we need? So the idea is that uh, we, since now we assume that the clock frequency uh, was fixed 
and that's uh, when the clock frequency is fixed, uh, it's easier because basically you can uh, ignore the fact that uh, the runtime of your task actually scales with the clock frequency. But what happens if the uh, clock frequency varies? Uh, it's pretty simple to actually uh, deal with it. Uh, we just have to scale the uh, reservation runtime. So the idea is that uh, since basically you can assume that the actual runtime scales linearly with the frequency, you'll be scal scaling linearly also the uh, runtime, let's say the best case runtime. And that's the formula you have to apply. You basically take the original runtime and then you multiply by the ratio uh, between max and current frequency. And that basically allows your task to uh, still execute in, inside the same reservation without modifying the reservation. So you specify your parameters considering the highest OPP. So let's say 10 milliseconds over 100 milliseconds. And then you let the uh, runtime uh, adapt to the current frequency using this formula. That's basically the, the idea. Yes? Yes, uh, the, basically the, the, the algorithm works uh, in the same way. Uh, I actually have uh, an example here, probably uh, answering your question. So let's say uh, I run these tests on an I keyboard. Uh, the I keyboard has uh, five operating points in the A53 uh, CPUs. Those are the operating points, so it goes between uh, from 208 megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz, and there's uh, the associated capacity in a 1024 scale. So the formula, let's say that you have this task that actually has 12 milliseconds over 100 milliseconds reservation at max frequency. That translates, for example, if you then try to run the task at minimum frequency, that translates to 69 milliseconds. So you let to extend the runtime, the 12 milliseconds, up to 69 milliseconds. And that's actually what, what's happening. So here, basically, in the first, uh, in the first plot, I'm running the task. Uh, so basically, I'm running a 10 millisecond over 100 millisecond task inside the 12 millisecond, 100 millisecond reservation. So everything is fine. The task computes and uh, uh, ends up computing before it's actually throttled. Uh, if I then run the same, but at the minimum frequency, uh, the, the actual runtime is extended. I mean, it, it takes 60 milliseconds then to actually ex execute the same amount of work. And that's still fine, because I know that my reservation actually get extended to 69 milliseconds. So as soon as the task, for example, here, I incremented of 10 milliseconds in the third one, the actual runtime of the task. So as soon as task, in this case, tries to ex execute for more than 69 milliseconds, it's actually throttled. So the, the algorithm is actually working consi consistently. Yeah? What about Right. So for uh, the, the question is, what about uh, basically big little systems? And uh, basically, it's the last point I had here. Uh, you have to apply the very same formula, but considering the max capacity of the two, uh, of the two CPUs type. Basically, it will be, you have to scale twice. You scale one for the frequency, and then you take the same and scale again, comparing the max capacity of the CPUs of the system all over, and the current, so the, the max capacity of the CPU you are executing. It's basically applying the same scaling uh, twice. And that's actually what, uh, for example, the parentity lot tracking in scale fair is actually doing. So it's very the same uh, uh, solution. All right. So now we basically have all the ingredients to actually be able to uh, scale, I mean, uh, control the clock frequency from the scheduler. So you're probably aware uh, of the schedule util CPU frag governor. Uh, this governor has been merged uh, recently in the last year. It's basically uh, a small, uh, a thin layer between the scheduler and CPU frac uh, driver. And with that, you can actually drive uh, clock frequency from the scheduler. Uh, currently, it uses uh, Foursquet normal, Foursquet normal, so fair task. It uses the utilization average, utilization signal and then uh, uses that compared to the max capacity of the CPU to actually uh, compute the frequency needed to meet the task requirements. This is basically a, a running, 
running average of uh, the task uh, executing on the system. Uh, currently, the problem is that uh, both SCAD 5 and SCAD normal, as soon as you schedule a SCAD 5 or SCAD normal task, you go to max, because basically there is no idea of how much uh, utilization bandwidth and clock frequency is actually required to meet those task requirements. The idea uh, is that uh, once uh, bandwidth reclaiming will be in, we can use the uh, running bandwidth, so it's our U act I was talking about, to actually have uh, a per CPU utilization contribution of SCAD deadline. So the idea would be I have the util average coming from uh, FAIR. Uh, I sum up this with the uh, UX so or running bandwidth of deadline, and then I can translate this amount of utilization uh, into a frequency, uh, a clock frequency. So that's how I'll be driving uh, frequency selection also for, for deadline. Um, Another, let's say that uh, is not the only uh, modification needed uh, currently in mainline. So one of the problems is that uh, the triggering points for actually driving frequency selection, so when basically the points where the uh, scheduler actually asks the uh, governor and the driver to actually change frequency, for both for FIFO and uh, deadline, they reside in the basically tick uh, handling code, which for deadline, I mean, it makes sense now because it's, I mean, commonplace you always call when you have something active. But in the light of what I've been actually talking uh, today, we have to move those points where the uh, running bandwidth is, so where the U, uh, U active actually changes. That's a special question, actually. So <laughs> if, you, if you actually was able to follow. So where do you think this running bandwidth actually changes? Anybody? So, well, one point is probably easy. So let's say you have a task, and then uh, when do you actually have to increment the U, the U act for the CPU? Sorry? Uh, that's basically uh, the finishing. So. Let's say the first thing you have to do is actually increment the, the variable when the task wakes up the first time, right? So that's one of the points where you actually potentially want to trigger a frequency selection. The other one is actually what you were saying, basically. When a task goes to sleep, uh, you potentially want to actually remove his uh, contribution to the active utilization, and that's where you potentially want to, tri to trigger a frequency selection. Uh, it's not instantaneously when a task goes to sleep. It's the infamous zero leg time I was talking about before. So you set up the timer, and when the timer fires and you actually decrement the U, U act, you can actually trigger the frequency selection saying, okay, this task is, uh, is gone, so you might be slowing down your, your frequency. That's basically it. Uh, yeah, another modification that will be most probably, I mean, required is that uh, on platform that uh, actually needs a sleepable context to actually change frequency, like ARM platform, uh, we need uh, a K-worker thread to actually do, uh, and, I mean, to actually call in the driver and actually perform the uh, frequency switch. And that, that, uh, that thread is currently a SCAD 5 thread. Of course, if you, are, if you want to change the frequency to, uh, for a deadline task, we let to make also the thread deadline and maybe treat it like uh, specially because uh, you basically want to always that the guy always uh, preempt any other deadline task just to be able to change the frequency in uh, in lot of those. So those are basically three main modifications. Uh, some results. Uh, I probably skim through this because I don't have much time left. Uh, just saying that, for example, here, uh, the basic idea, then you can uh, go offline and uh, see better. I have actually extensive results uh, collected, and you can, uh, there, uh, you can actually look at them. Basically, the idea is that, uh, at least with the simple example, you are meeting both tasks uh, requirements, so deadlines. You don't have any, let's say that uh, what you actually want to see is that the red line doesn't go below zero and uh, while you are not running at the maximum frequency. So 
that's basically the trade-off you actually want to, to achieve, and it seems to be, to be working. As I said, I, I don't spend much time in this because I have to cover the next bit. So, group scheduling. Why uh, we want this? So currently, uh, scheduling works one-to-one. Uh, -one. So you have a one-to-one -one association between task and uh, reservation. Uh, the idea is that sometimes uh, it's actually might be easier or better to be able to group a set of tasks inside the same reservation. Just because, for example, I don't know, you can uh, post an application is like a rendering pipeline with, where you don't actually know which bits and you, can actually, you can't actually come up with the runtime period for each task uh, that belongs to the pipeline. Or for example, you just have a legacy application composed by different threads, and you can, can go and modify the application source code. Or uh, for example, you have to manage, uh, no, for example, KVM threads, and one way would be to uh, reserve a portion of the uh, CPU uh, bandwidth using group scheduling. Uh, what we have to implement, that there are uh, working program, work in progress patches also for this. They're not being uh, yet discussed on the mini list, so they're going to be posted hopefully in the next month or so. Uh, it's what we call group or hierarchical uh, scheduling support. Uh, again, there are a lot of references on the slide, so please go and check them out. Uh, the idea is that uh, you will then have uh, temporal isolation but between uh, groups that contains more than one task. The approach will be hierarchical in the sense that uh, at root level, so the first level will be managed by EDF, like deadline already does, and inside the uh, deadline reservation, you'll be actually scheduling considering FIFO. Basically, you'll, you'll have, uh, in this case, for example, T1, T2, T3, and 4, are five for tasks that actually are scheduled inside deadline reservation. So the, let's say the, the, the root scheduler will pick a group of tasks considering the, the deadlines, and those deadlines are managed by the constant bandwidth server, again, like with simple one-to-one -one tasks, and then you have to actually execute again the scheduler inside the uh, group of tasks to pick one of the tasks you're actually scheduling with FIFO. Uh, the idea, uh, I think Peter actually mentioned this uh, several times, is actually to remove uh, the RT throttling and actually substitute that with this mechanism. So what's the RT throttling? Anybody? Mechanism? Right. So it's basically, it's mostly, let's say, the bug mechanism to actually prevent uh, five for RT task to actually jeopardize all the CPU. And that's basically more, I mean, theoretically it's the same thing, because here I will reserve uh, a portion of the CPU using deadline, and uh, so that I can, after I have this, I can remove that, uh, that uh, mechanism. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the API, let's say the, the user space API won't change because you still have uh, RT groups. It just, who manages those groups will change. It won't be uh, RT anymore, it will be deadline managing those groups. But you still, I mean, from user space, you'll still be creating uh, groups and then put in inside tasks and then uh, manage the RT runtime, RT period of those groups. So no changes uh, required from an application point of view, I'd say. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, but that's the same thing you are doing today. So you have to configure groups. If you want, if you want to use RT throttling, let's say not the uh, global one, but the per group one, you still have to create a group, uh, assign the RT runtime and period for the group, and then put your FIFO task inside the group. And that's basically one change. 
it's only managed by a different guy. It will be deadly instead of five. And uh, it basically, on a multiprocessor system, how it will work, basically you'll have, uh, so each group has only two parameters. It's runtime over period. And uh, that is basically you, you will replicate the same amount of reserve bandwidth o across all CPUs. So you will have a scheduled deadline entity on each of your CPU. And then you'll basically, those, those guys, the, the FIFO guys will be executing inside those scheduling entities, which basically represent like some kind of virtual processors. Because virtual processors, because for example, when you have to uh, perform global scheduling, so the push-pull mechanism will actually pull and push tasks between the scheduled deadline entities that you have on each CPU. That's basically the, the idea. Uh, I don't have much more uh, details about this just because it's really more work in progress than the other one. Uh, but I mean, if you have any more questions, uh, just uh, ask me also offline, of course. And we are mostly done. So future. Uh, what I didn't cover and what's still me missing. So as said, the, the real near thing that's happening right now for me is actually try to start experimenting with all these new features on Android, see if we can convert like the current usage of FIFO to actually start using Deadly and see how it goes. Uh, another idea that would be probably needed to implement is that uh, in principle you can actually think to uh, let the task run for more than uh, reserved at uh, admission control time by demoting them towards lower priority task, uh, class. Sorry. Uh, so when the task uh, gets throttled, instead of throttling the task, I will demote it to run on FIFO or normal so it can actually co continue executing, but together with the other uh, lower priority uh, tasks on the, on the system. And then, of course, uh, the capacity and energy awareness. So the fact that, uh, for example, if you have a big little system, now that we actually have a notion of how much capacity actually each task needs, we'll have to make modification to actually uh, know where uh, I have to put a task considering the spare capacity of the different CPUs, also considering that they, they can have actually different max capacities. And then uh, using uh, this added information, then I uh, will also con uh, have to consider energy in the picture. So the energy aware scheduler, uh, energy aware uh, scheduler actually adds uh, an energy model of the platform and makes it available to the scheduler. So the idea is to start consuming that information also from deadline to make uh, uh, energy aware decisions. Nearish, in the sense that uh, nobody's currently really working on this, so there are, I mean, you're more than welcome to contribute, is uh, mostly it's uh, the priority inheritance. So currently, priority inheritance for deadline means deadline inheritance. What we want to actually have is to implement uh, proxy execution. So I can actually execute inside someone else's reservation. And then maybe some kind of the dynamic feedback mechanism in which I can still adapt the tasks reservation. And that's it. So thanks again for, for coming. Uh, if you have any questions, just uh, ask me. I'll be here for the whole week. Uh, shoot me an email. Uh, just ask staff on the Linux Canary Mini list, uh, on Linux RT users. There is also an energy aware scheduler um, focus mini list called ESDev. Uh, we are actually organizing, this is going to be in Italy. Uh, I'm from Italy. so. Uh, we're going to organize a summit around the scheduling and uh, power management. You'll find more details at the, the link there. So if you are, uh, it's going to be in, in April, so it's really happening like next month. So I guess for the US-based residents, it can be tricky to, uh, to come because just because flights are extremely expensive, I guess. But if you are uh, in Europe and you want to come, you're more than uh, welcome. And uh, oh, yeah, uh, whoever got prizes, Please come and, and collect us. Thanks. <laughs>